This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, GreenKRI.com. Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 11 A Guide Found to the Center of the Earth. In the evening I took a short walk on the beach and returned at night to my plank bed, where I slept soundly all night. When I awoke I heard my uncle talking at a great rate in the next room. I immediately dressed and joined him. He was conversing in the Danish language with a tall man of robust build. This fine fellow must have been possessed of great strength. His eyes, set in a large and ingenuous face, seemed to me very intelligent. They were of a dreamy sea blue. Long hair, which would have been called red even in England, fell in long meshes upon his broad shoulders. The movements of this native were lithe and supple, but he made little use of his arms in speaking, like a man who knew nothing or cared nothing about the language of gestures. His whole appearance bespoke perfect calmness and self-possession, not indolence but tranquillity. It was felt at once that he would be beholden to nobody, that he worked for his own convenience, and that nothing in this world could astonish or disturb this philosophic calmness. I caught the shades of this Icelandish character by the way in which he listened to the impassioned flow of words which fell from the professor. He stood with arms crossed, perfectly unmoved by my uncle's incessant gesticulations. A negative was expressed by a slow movement of the head from left to right, an affirmative by a slight bend, so slight that his long hair scarcely moved. He carried economy of motion even to parsimony. Certainly I should never have dreamt in looking at this man that he was a hunter. He did not look likely to frighten his game, nor did he seem as if he would even get near it. But the mystery was explained when Mr. Fridrikson informed me that this tranquil personage was only a hunter of the Eider duck, whose under plumage constitutes the chief wealth of the island. This is the celebrated Eider down, and it requires no great rapidity of movement to get it. Early in summer the female, a very pretty bird, goes to build her nest among the rocks of the fjords with which the coast is fringed. After building the nest she feathers it with down plucked from her own breast. Immediately the hunter, or rather the trader, comes and robs the nest, and the female recommences her work. This goes on as long as she has any down left. When she has stripped herself bare, the male takes his turn to pluck himself. But as the coarse and hard plumage of the male has no commercial value, the hunter does not take the trouble to rob the nest of this. The female, therefore, lays her eggs in the spoils of her mate, the young are hatched, and next year the harvest begins again. Now, as the eater duck does not select steep cliffs for her nest, but rather the smooth terraced rocks which slope to the sea, the Icelandic hunter might exercise his calling without any inconvenient exertion. He was a farmer who was not obliged either to sow or reap his harvest, but merely to gather it in. This grave, phlegmatic, and silent individual was called Hans Bjelk, and he came recommended by Mr. Fridrikson. He was our future guide. His manners were a singular contrast with my uncle's. Nevertheless, they soon came to understand each other. Neither looked at the amount of the payment. The one was ready to accept whatever was offered, the other was ready to give whatever was demanded. Never was bargain more readily concluded. The result of the treaty was that Hans engaged on his part to conduct us to the village of Stapi, on the south shore of the Snaefell Peninsula, at the very foot of the volcano. By land this would be about twenty-two miles, to be done, said my uncle, in two days but when he learnt that the Danish mile was twenty-four thousand feet long, he was obliged to modify his calculations and allow seven or eight days for the march. Four horses were to be placed at our disposal, two to carry him and me, two for the baggage. Hans, as was his custom, would go on foot. He knew all that part of the coast perfectly, and promised to take us the shortest way. His engagement was not to terminate with our arrival at Stapi. He was to continue in my uncle's service for the whole period of his scientific researches, for the remuneration of three Ricksdales a week, about twelve shillings, but it was an express article of the covenant that his wages should be counted out to him 
every Saturday at six o'clock in the evening, which according to him was one indispensable part of the engagement. The start was fixed for the 16th of June. My uncle wanted to pay the hunter a portion in advance, but he refused with one word. After, said he. After, said the professor for my edification. The treaty concluded. Hans silently withdrew. A famous fellow, cried my uncle, but he little thinks of the marvellous part he has to play in the future. So he is to go with us as far as, as far as the centre of the earth, Axel. Forty-eight hours were left before our departure. To my great regret I had to employ them in preparations, for all our ingenuity was required to pack every article to the best advantage. Instruments here, arms there, tools in this package, provisions in that, four sets of packages in all. The instruments were, number one, an eagle centigrade thermometer graduated up to 150 degrees, 302 degrees Fahrenheit, which seemed to me too much or too little, too much if the internal heat was to rise so high, for in this case we should be baked, not enough to measure the temperature of springs or any matter in a state of fusion. Number two, an aneroid barometer, to indicate extreme pressures of the atmosphere. An ordinary barometer would not have answered the purpose, as the pressure would increase during our descent to a point which the mercurial barometer would not register. Begin note. In Mr. Verne's book a manometer is the instrument used, of which very little is known. In a complete list of philosophical instruments the translator cannot find the name. As he is assured by a first-rate instrument maker, Chadburn of Liverpool, that an aneroid can be constructed to measure any depth, he has thought it best to furnish the adventurous professor with this more familiar instrument. The manometer is generally known as a pressure gauge. End note. Number three, a chronometer, made by Boissonnas, June of Geneva, accurately set to the meridian of Hamburg. Number four, two compasses, viz. a common compass and a dipping needle. Number five, a night glass. Number six, two of Ruhmkorff's apparatus, which, by means of an electric current, supplied a safe and handy portable light. Begin note. Ruhmkorff's apparatus consists of a Bunsen pile worked with bichromate of potash, which makes no smell. An induction coil carries the electricity generated by the pile into communication with a lantern of peculiar construction. In this lantern there is a spiral glass tube from which the air has been excluded, and in which remains only a residuum of carbonic acid or of nitrogen. When the apparatus is put in action this gas becomes luminous, producing a white steady light. The pile and coil are placed in a leathern bag which the traveller carries over his shoulders. The lantern outside of the bag throws sufficient light into deep darkness. It enables one to venture without fear of explosions into the midst of the most inflammable gases, and is not extinguished even in the deepest waters. Mr. Ruhmkorff is a learned and most ingenious man of science. His great discovery is his induction coil, which produces a powerful stream of electricity. He obtained, in 1864, the quinquennial prize of 50,000 franc reserved by the French government for the most ingenious application of electricity. End note. The arms consisted of Purdy's rifles and two brace of pistols. But what did we want arms for? We had neither savages nor wild beasts to fear, I supposed. But my uncle seemed to believe in his arsenal as in his instruments, and more especially in a considerable quantity of gun-cotton, which is unaffected by moisture, and the explosive force of which exceeds that of gunpowder. The tools comprised two pickaxes, two spades, a silk rope-ladder, three iron-tipped sticks, a hatchet, a hammer, a dozen wedges and iron spikes, and a long knotted rope. Now this was a large load, for the ladder was three hundred feet long. And there were provisions, too. This was not a large parcel, but it was comforting to know that of essence of beef and biscuits there were six months' consumption. Spirits were the only liquid, and of water we took none. But we had flasks, and my uncle depended on springs from which to fill them. Whatever objections I hazarded as to their quality, temperature, and even absence, remained ineffectual. To complete the exact inventory of all our travelling accompaniments, I must not forget a pocket medicine chest, 
containing blunt scissors, splints for broken limbs, a piece of tape of unbleached linen, bandages and compresses, lint, a lancet for bleeding, all dreadful articles to take with one. Then there was a row of phials containing dextrin, alcoholic ether, liquid acetate of lead, vinegar, and ammonia drugs which afforded me no comfort. Finally, all the articles needful to supply room course apparatus. My uncle did not forget a supply of tobacco, coarse-grained powder, and amadou, nor a leathern belt in which he carried a sufficient quantity of gold, silver, and paper money. Six pairs of boots and shoes, made waterproof with a composition of India rubber, and naphtha were packed amongst the tools. "'Clothed, shod, and equipped like this,' said my uncle, "'there is no telling how far we may go.' The fourteenth was wholly spent in arranging all our different articles. In the evening we dined with Baron Tramps, the mayor of Rejkevik, and Dr. Hjaltelin, the first medical man of the place, being of the party. Mr. Fredrickson was not there. I learned afterwards that he and the governor disagreed upon some question of administration, and did not speak to each other. I therefore knew not a single word of all that was said at this semi-official dinner, but I could not help noticing that my uncle talked the whole time. On the fifteenth our preparations were all made. Our host gave the professor very great pleasure by presenting him with a map of Iceland far more complete than that of Henderson. It was the map of Mr. Olaf Nicholas Olsen, in the proportion of one to four hundred and eighty thousand of the actual size of the island, and published by the Icelandic Literary Society. It was a precious document for a mineralogist. Our last evening was spent in intimate conversation with Mr. Fredrickson, with whom I felt the liveliest sympathy. Then, after the talk, succeeded, for me at any rate, a disturbed and restless night. At five in the morning I was awoke by the neighing and pawing of four horses under my window. I dressed hastily and came down into the street. Hans was finishing our packing, almost as it were without moving a limb, and yet he did his work cleverly. My uncle made more noise than execution, and the guide seemed to pay very little attention to his energetic directions. At six o'clock our preparations were over. Mr. Fredrickson shook hands with us. My uncle thanked him heartily for his extreme kindness. I constructed a few fine Latin sentences to express my cordial farewell. Then we bestrode our steeds, and with his last adieu, Mr. Fredrickson treated me to a line of Virgil eminently applicable to such uncertain wanderers as we were likely to be. Et quacumque viam dedent fortuna sequamur. Therever fortune clears away, thither our ready footsteps stray. End of chapter 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Kristin Luoma green kri dot com of journey to the interior of the earth by jules verne chapter twelve a barren land we had started under a sky overcast but calm there was no fear of heat none of disastrous rain it was just the weather for tourists the pleasure of riding on horseback over an unknown country made me easy to be pleased at our first start. I threw myself wholly into the pleasure of the trip, and enjoyed the feeling of freedom and satisfied desire. I was beginning to take a real share in the enterprise. Besides, I said to myself, where's the risk? Here we are, travelling, all through a most interesting country. We are about to climb a very remarkable mountain. At the worst we are going to scramble down an extinct crater. It is evident that Saknussem did nothing more than this. As for a passage leading to the centre of the globe, it is mere rubbish, perfectly impossible. Very well, then. Let us get all the good we can out of this expedition, and don't let us haggle about the chances. This reasoning having settled my mind, we got out of Rejkjavik. Hans moved steadily on, keeping ahead of us at an even, smooth, and rapid pace. The baggage-horses followed him without giving any trouble. Then came my uncle and myself, 
looking not so very ill-mounted on our small but hardy animals. Iceland is one of the largest islands in Europe. Its surface is 14,000 square miles, and it contains but 16,000 inhabitants. Geographers have divided it into four quarters, and we were crossing diagonally the southwest quarter, called the Sudvester Fjordunger. On leaving Redkivik, Hans took us by the seashore. We passed lean pastures which were trying very hard, but in vain, to look green. Yellow came out best. The rugged peaks of the trachyte rocks presented faint outlines on the eastern horizon. At times a few patches of snow, concentrating the vague light, glittered upon the slopes of the distant mountains. Certain peaks, boldly uprising, passed through the great clouds, and reappeared above the moving mists like breakers emerging in the heavens. Often these chains of barren rocks made a dip towards the sea, and encroached upon the scanty pasturage, but there was always enough room to pass. Besides, our horse instinctively chose the easiest places without ever slackening their pace. My uncle was refused even the satisfaction of stirring up his beast with whip or voice. He had no excuse for being impatient, could not help smiling to see so tall a man on so small a pony, and his long legs nearly touched the ground he looked like a six-legged centaur. "'Good horse, good horse,' he kept saying. "'You will see, Axel, that there is no more sagacious animal than the Icelandic horse. He is stopped by neither snow, nor storm, nor impassable roads, nor rocks, glaciers, or anything. He is courageous, sober, and sure-footed. He never makes a false step, never shies. If there is a river or fjord to cross, and we shall meet with many, you will see him plunge in at once, just as if he were amphibious, and gain the opposite bank. But we must not hurry him. We must let him have his way, and we shall get on at the rate of thirty miles a day. We may, but how about our guide? Oh, never mind him. People like him get over the ground without a thought. There is so little action in this man that he will never get tired. And besides, if he wants it, he shall have my horse. I shall get cramped if I don't have a little action. The arms are all right, but the legs want exercise. We were advancing at a rapid pace. The country was already almost a desert. Here and there was a lonely farm, called the Boer, built either of wood or of sods, or of pieces of lava, looking like a poor beggar by the wayside. These ruinous huts seemed to solicit charity from passers-by, and on very small provocation we should have given alms for the relief of the poor inmates. In this country there were no roads and paths, and the poor vegetation, however slow, would soon efface the rare traveller's footsteps. Yet this part of the province, at a very small distance from the capital, is reckoned among the inhabited and cultivated portions of Iceland. What, then, must other tracks be, more desert than this desert? In the first half-mile we had not seen one farmer standing before his cabin door, nor one shepherd tending a flock less wild than himself, nothing but a few cows and sheep left to themselves. What then would be those convulsed regions upon which we were advancing, regions subject to the dire phenomena of eruptions, the offspring of volcanic explosions and subterranean convulsions? We were to know them before too long, but on consulting Olsen's map I saw that they would be avoided by winding along the seashore. In fact, the great plutonic ashen is confined to the central portion of the island. There, rocks of the Trapean and volcanic class, including trachyte, basalt and tufts, and agglomerates associated with streams of lava, have made this land of supernatural horrors. I had no idea of the spectacle which was awaiting us in the peninsula of Snaefell, where these ruins of a fiery nature have formed a frightful chaos. In two hours from Rejkivik we arrived at the burg of Gifuns, called Eilkirkja, or Principal Church. There was nothing remarkable here but a few houses, scarcely enough for a German hamlet. Hans stopped there half an hour. He shared with us our frugal breakfast, answering my uncle's questions about the road and our resting place that night with merely a yes or no, except when he said, Garter. I consulted the map to see where Garter was. 
I saw there was a small town of that name on the banks of the F Falfjord, four miles from Rejkivik. I showed it to my uncle. Four miles only, he exclaimed. Four miles out of twenty-eight. What a nice little walk. He was about to make an observation to the guide, who, without answering, resumed his place at the head and went on his way. Three hours later, still treading on the colorless grass of the pasture-land, we had to work around the Kola fjord, a longer way but an easier one than across the, that inlet. We soon entered into a pingsteor, or perished, called Edelberg, from whose steeple twelve o'clock would have struck, if Icelandic churches were rich enough to possess clocks. But they are like the parishioners who have no watches and do without. There our horses were baited. Then, taking the narrow path to left between a chain of hills and the sea, they carried us to our next stage, the Eil Kirja of Brantar, and one mile further on, to Sauerbor, Anexia, a chapel of ease built on the south shore of Hvalfjord. It was now four o'clock, and we had gone four Icelandic miles, or twenty-four English miles. In that place the fjord was at least three English miles wide. The waves rolled with a rushing din upon the sharp-pointed rocks. This inlet was confined between walls of rock, precipices crowned by sharp peaks two thousand feet high, and remarkable for the brown strata which separated the beds of reddish tuff. However much I might respect the intelligence of our quadrupeds, I hardly cared to put it to the test by trusting myself to it on horseback across an arm of the sea. If they are as intelligent as they are said to be, I thought, they won't try it. In any case, I will tax my intelligence to direct theirs. But my uncle would not wait. He spurred on to the edge. His steed lowered his head to examine the nearest waves and stopped. My uncle, who had an instinct of his own, too applied pressure and was again refused by the animal significantly shaking his head. Then followed strong language and the whip. But the brute answered these arguments with kicks and endeavors to throw his rider. At last the clever little pony, with a bend of his knees, started from under the professor's legs and left him standing upon two boulders on the shore just like the Colossus of Rhodes. "'Confounded brute!' cried the unhorsed horseman, suddenly degraded into a pedestrian, just as ashamed as a cavalry officer degraded to a foot soldier. Farja said the guide, touching his shoulder. "'What? A boat?' "'Dur!' replied Hans, pointing to one. "'Yes,' I cried, "'there is a boat.' "'Why did you not say so, then? Well, let us go on.' "'Tidvatten,' said the guide. "'What is he saying?' "'He says tide,' said my uncle, translating the Danish word. "'No doubt we must wait for the tide.' "'Forbida,' said my uncle. "'Ja,' yeah, replied Hans. "'My uncle stamped with his foot while the horses went on to the boat. "'I perfectly understood the necessity of abiding a particular moment of the tide "'to undertake the crossing of the fjord, "'when the sea, having reached its greatest height, it should be slack water.' Then the ebb and flow have no sensible effect, and the boat does not risk being carried either to the bottom or out to the sea. That favorable moment arrived only with six o'clock, when my uncle, myself, the guide, two other passengers, and the four horses, trusted ourselves to a somewhat fragile raft. Accustomed as I was to the swift and sure steamers on the Elbe, I found the oars of the rowers rather a slow means of propulsion. It took us more than an hour to cross the fjord but the passage was effected without any mishap. In another half-hour we reached the Eilkirkja of Gardar. End of chapter 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mer Lafferty from Geek Foo Action Grip www.geekfooactiongrip.com Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne 
Chapter 13 Hospitality Under the Arctic Circle It ought to have been night time, but under the 65th parallel there was nothing surprising in the nocturnal polar light. In Iceland, during the months of June and July, the sun does not set. But the temperature was much lower. I was cold, and more hungry than cold. Welcome was the side of the boyer, which was hospitably open to receive us. It was a peasant's house, but in point of hospitality it was equal to a king's. On our arrival the master came with outstretched hands, and without more ceremony he beckoned us to follow him. To accompany him down the long, narrow, dark passage would have been impossible. Therefore we followed, as he bid us. The building was constructed of roughly squared timbers, with rooms on both sides, four in number, all opening out into the one passage. These were the kitchen, the weaving shop, the bad stofa, or family sleeping room, and the visitors' rooms, which was the best of all. My uncle, whose height had not been thought of in the building of the house, of course hit his head several times against the beams that projected from the ceilings. We were introduced into our apartment, a large room with the floor of earth stamped hard down and lighted by a window, the panes of which were formed of sheep's bladder, not admitting too much light. The sleeping accommodation consisted of dry litter thrown into two wooden frames painted red and ornamented with Icelandic sentences. I was hardly expecting so much comfort. The only discomfort proceeded from the strong odor of dried fish, hung meat, and sour milk, of which my nose made bitter complaints. When we had laid aside our traveling wraps, the voice of the host was heard inviting us into the kitchen, the only room where a fire was lighted even in the severest cold. My uncle lost no time in obeying the friendly call, nor was I slack in following. The kitchen chimney was constructed on the ancient pattern. In the middle of the room was a stone for a hearth. Over it, in the roof, was a hole to let the smoke escape. The kitchen was also a dining room. At our entrance the host, as if he had never seen us, greeted us with one word, Selvertu, which means be happy, and came and kissed us on the cheek. After him, his wife pronounced the same words, accompanied with the same ceremonial. Then the two, placing their hands upon their hearts, inclined profoundly before us. I hasten to inform the reader that this Icelandic lady was the mother of nineteen children, all, big and little, swarming in the midst of the dense wreath of smoke with which the fire on the hearth filled the chamber. Every moment I noticed a fair-haired and rather melancholy face peeping out of the rolling volumes of smoke. They were a perfect cluster of unwashed angels. My uncle and I treated this little tribe with kindness, and in a very short time we each had three or four of these brats on our shoulders, as many on our laps, and the rest between our knees. Those who could speak kept repeating, Selvertu, in every conceivable tone. Those that could not speak made up for that want by shrill cries. This concert was brought to a close by the announcement of dinner. At that moment our hunter returned, who had been seeing his horses provided for, that is to say, he had economically let them loose in the fields, where the poor beasts had to content themselves with the scanty moss they could pull off the rocks and a few meager seaweeds, and the next day they would not fail to come of themselves and resume the labors of the previous day. Selvertu, said Hans. Then calmly, automatically, and dispassionately, he kissed the host, the hostess, and their nineteen children. The ceremony over, we sat at the table, twenty-four in number, and therefore one upon another. The luckiest had only two urchins upon their knees. But silence reigned in all this little world at the arrival of the soup, and the national taciturnity resumed its empire even over the children. The host served out to us soup made of lichen, and by no means unpleasant, then an immense piece of dried fish floating in butter rancid with twenty years' keeping and therefore, according to Icelandic gastronomy, much preferable to fresh butter. Along with this we had sky, a sort of clotted milk, with biscuits, and a liquid prepared from juniper berries. For beverage we had a thin milk mixed with water, called in this country blanda. It is not for me to decide whether this diet is wholesome or not. All I can say is that I was desperately hungry, and that at dessert I swallowed to the very last gulp of a thick broth made from buckwheat. As soon as the meal was over, the children disappeared, and their elders gathered round the peat fire, which also burnt such miscellaneous fuel as briars, cow dung, and fish bones. After this little pinch of warmth, the different groups retired to their respective rooms. Our hostess hospitably offered us her assistance in undressing, according to Icelandic usage. 
but on our gracefully declining, she insisted no longer, and I was able at last to curl myself up in my mossy bed. At five next morning, we bade our host farewell, my uncle with difficulty persuading him to accept a proper remuneration, and Hans signaled the start. At a hundred yards from Gardar, the soil began to change its aspect. It became boggy and less favorable to progress. On our right, the chain of mountains was indefinitely prolonged like an immense system of natural fortifications, of which we were following the counterscarp, or lesser steep. Often we were met by streams, which we had to ford with great care, not to wet our packages. The desert became wilder and more hideous, yet from time to time we seemed to descry a human figure that fled at our approach. Sometimes a sharp turn would bring us suddenly within a short distance of one of these specters, and I was filled with loathing at the sight of a huge deformed head, the skin shining and hairless, and repulsive sores visible through the gaps in the poor creature's wretched rags. The unhappy being forbore to approach us and offer his misshapen hand. He fled away, but not before Hans had saluted him with the customary, Selvertu Spetels, said he. A leper, my uncle repeated. This word produced a repulsive effect. The horrible disease of leprosy is too common in Iceland. It is not contagious, but hereditary, and lepers are forbidden to marry. These apparitions were not cheerful, and they did not throw any charm over the less and less attractive landscapes. The last tufts of grass had disappeared from beneath our feet. Not a tree was to be seen, unless we except a few dwarf birches as low as brushwood. Not an animal, but a few wandering ponies that their owners would not feed. Sometimes we would see a hawk balancing himself on his wings under the gray cloud, and then darting away south with a rapid flight. I felt melancholy under the savage aspect of nature, and my thoughts went away to the cheerful scenes I had left in the far south. We had to cross a few narrow fjords, and at last quite a wide gulf. The tide, then high, allowed us to pass over without delay, and to reach the hamlet of Alftanes, one mile beyond. That evening, after having forded two rivers full of trout and pike, called Afta and Heta, we were obliged to spend the night in a deserted building worthy to be haunted by all the elfins of Scandinavia. The Ice King certainly held court here, and gave us all night-long samples of what he could do. No particular event marked the next day. Bogs, dead levels, melancholy desert tracks, wherever we traveled. By nightfall we had accomplished half our journey, and we lay at Krosolpt. On the 19th of June, for about a mile, that is an Icelandic mile, we walked upon hardened lava. This ground is called in the country Hran. The writhen surface presented the appearance of disordered, twisted cables, sometimes stretched in length, sometimes contorted together. An immense torrent, once liquid, now solid, ran from the nearest mountains, now extinct volcanoes, but the ruins around revealed the violence of the past eruptions. Yet here and there were a few jets of steam from hot springs. We had no time to watch this phenomena. We had to proceed on our way. Soon at the foot of the mountains the boggy land reappeared, intersected by little lakes. Our route now lay westward. We had turned the great bay of Faxa, and the twin peaks of Snaefell rose white into the cloudy sky at the distance of at least five miles. The horses did their duty well. No difficulty stopped them in their steady career. I was getting tired, but my uncle was as firm and straight as he was at our first start. I could not help admiring his persistency, as well as the hunters, who treated our expedition like a mere promenade. June 20th. At 6 p.m. we reached Birder, a village on the seashore, and the guide there, claiming his due, my uncle settled with him. It was Hans's own family, that is, his uncles and cousins, who gave us hospitality. We were kindly received, and without taxing too much the goodness of these folks, I would willingly have tarried here to recruit after my fatigue. But my uncle, who wanted no recruiting, would not hear of it, and the next morning we had to bestride our beasts again. The soil told of the neighborhood of the mountain, whose granite foundations rose from the earth like the knotted roots of some huge oak. We were rounding the immense base of the volcano. The professor hardly took his eyes off it. He tossed up his arms and seemed to defy it, and to declare, There stands the giant that I shall conquer. After about four hours walking, the horses stopped of their own accord at the door of the priest's house at Stapi. End of chapter 13